Last Sabbath, we began looking at the fourth commandment in this series on the Ten Commandments to keep holy the seventh day Sabbath. I concluded last week's message by looking at the concept of rest, Sabbath rest, and what it symbolizes. You might remember that we begin our experience with God's redemption in our life by resting first in the redemptive work God has done for us. We begin by resting in that. And you can use the word rest, faith. We begin by putting faith in what God has done for us. That's the beginning point. We begin by resting in the fact that Jesus died for our sins. That Jesus gives us forgiveness. He gives us eternal life. And that he gives us his righteousness to cover us. That's where we begin our walk with the Lord. We begin by resting in those truths of redemption. We also rest in the fact that at the cross, when Jesus was on the cross, the power of our sinful nature was broken. So we do not need to be controlled by our sinful nature. We rest in that truth. We believe that truth. And therefore, because of that, we can have assurance that we can obey God and serve him, that the sinful nature need not control us. Also, we rest in the fact as we live our daily life in the Lord, we rest in the fact that Jesus lives in us. And that as we learn, and it is a learning process, we learn how to let him live out his life of obedience in us when we're tempted. So we rest in those facts, in those truths of redemption. And that's what Sabbath rest symbolizes. And once we rest in those truths, then we will be able to serve God most effectively in our life, in our ministry, service for him. Now there's another, and, and by the way, this is all actually taught in the creation story, as I pointed out last week. The idea that God worked and rested, and Adam first rested, you know, his first day of life was the seventh day. He rested and then went about his work of fulfilling God's purpose. That, that whole gospel is in the creation account. There's another important truth that's also taught in the creation account. If you look in Genesis, you read that at the, the end of each day, it says the evening and the morning were the first day. Then it describes what God did on the second day. And then it says the evening and the morning were the second day. And it does, goes that every, every day, right through each day of the week, finishing off on the sixth day, when God said, let us make man in our image. And he, the crowning act of the creation was the creation of Adam, mankind. And the evening and morning were the sixth day. Why did he end each description of each day's work with that expression? Well, the reason he said that is that that meant that work was completed and would not be repeated. He did it. It would not be repeated. That's what he did that day. And then he'd go on to the next day. What did he do there? And what was done that day would not be repeated. In a sense, it was closed off. In parentheses, the evening and the morning were the first day, and here's what's in that day. And then close off the second day. It's closing it off. This is what he did. It won't be repeated. Now, when we read our text in Genesis chapter 2 that was read this morning we find something interesting. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, okay, here's another day. 
We've had one, two, three, four, five, six. Now we've got a seventh. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done and rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day, sanctified that seventh day, because that in it he had rested from all the work which God had done, he had created and made. By the way, of all the days of creation week, it's the seventh day is the only one that he blessed, he set aside, he sanctified for special use. The seventh day. But there's something missing here. This day does not say, and the evening and the morning were the seventh day. It doesn't say that. There's a reason for that. And the reason for that is that what he did on the seventh day would be repeated. I'm going to explain that. You might notice when um, when the creation was done, he said it was very good. He looked over the creation. He said it was very good. He didn't say it was holy. He said it was very good. Now, what does that mean then in relation to this seventh day? Well, what it means is God had plans to make part of the creation he had just made holy. What part of the creation did he want to make holy? Adam, Eve, us. From the very beginning, creation of mankind, we were to be holy. Now, that's in why Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden of Eden. They were placed there because they had a choice to either obey God or disobey God, one or the other. Now, if they continued a life of obedience to God, they would have grown spiritually. They would have grown into this holy man and woman, fully reflecting the character of God. That was the plan. However, we know the sad story. And what we find here is that obedience and holiness are interlocked. Obedience and holiness go hand in hand, are closely related. We see that from the story of the angels in the fall. Who are the holy angels? Those that chose to obey God. Holy, obedient angels. Who are the unholy angels? Those that choose to disobey God. That's not a complicated equation. <laughs> so obedience and holiness go hand in hand. And it has always been God's plan from the creation of Adam and Eve that his people that he created would be a holy people. That's always been his plan. A holy people. You read this in the Old Testament, Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, okay, there's obedience, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God's desire was that Israel would be a holy nation, an obedient people, a holy people. You find this in Leviticus 20, verse 7 and 8. Sanctify yourselves, therefore. Something sanctified is when it's set aside for special use. The seventh-day Sabbath is a sanctified day set aside for special use, different than the other six days. So God is saying here, sanctify yourselves, put yourselves aside, be different, separate from the world, 
those around you. Sanctify yourself, yourselves, therefore, and be holy. For I am holy. I'm the holy Lord your God. And you shall keep my statutes and do them. For I am the Lord which sanctify you. So there it is again. Israel was called to be a holy people, an obedient people, to serve their God. Holiness, obedience go hand in hand. We find this in the New Testament. John 17, 17, we know this, you probably know this by heart. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word. <laughs> yes, sanctify them through thy word. Let me read it. <laughs> sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. There you go. To sanctify, make holy. So he's saying, make holy, become holy through the truth of my word, through obedience to my word. In Romans 7, 12. Wherefore, the law is holy, the commandment holy. So God's Ten Commandments define holiness. God's Ten Commandments define the character of God. We're told they're a transcript of God's character. So the commandments define holiness. What, it, what does a holy person look like in their life? Well, you look at the commandments, that's what they look like in their life. That's, that's what he's saying there. Now, this is why God gave Israel the Ten Commandments soon after he delivered them from Egypt. Now, as I said before, God did not give them the commandments in Egypt. He did not say, here are the Ten Commandments, obey them and I will deliver you. That's the backwards order of things. First comes deliverance. First comes salvation. Then obedience. So God first delivered his people out of Egypt. Now that they are a delivered people unto God, he gives them the Ten Commandments. Why? They needed to know how to be that holy people. They needed to have God's law. Remember, the commandment is holy, just and good. They needed that to become the holy people of God. Also taught in the New Testament, God wants us today to be a holy people, of course. 1 Peter 1, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Why is that important to God? Why is it essential God's people be obedient? It's essential because only a holy, obedient people can enter into intimate fellowship with a holy God. You see, holy angels are in close fellowship with God. Unholy angels, there's no way impossible so as a people so the more in harmony with God we become in our life and grow in a relationship with him more of an obedient holy people we become this is what the cross was all about Isaiah 59 tells us that sin separates us from God sin is the opposite of holiness Christ took upon himself the consequences of our sin. He died the death we deserve so that our relationship with God could be restored. And that's what the plan of salvation is all about. Now, you've heard me talk a lot about the Baptist Holy Spirit. It is through the daily Baptist Holy Spirit that Christ can live in us most fully. Therefore, it is through the Baptist Holy Spirit that we can grow more and more like Christ, more and more in holiness. Paul here describes this, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, God's doing a work in us, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, 
you could also put in holiness there. We were created for good works. We were created to obey the commandments. We were created to be a holy people. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, unto holiness, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. <laughs> so by Christ living in us and living out his faithful, loving obedience, his holiness in and through us, again, we can become that holy people. And by the way, those who are ready to meet Jesus will be a holy people. Remember the text in Revelation 22, 11 and 12? He that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. It's Christ's holiness, obedience says. It's Christ's righteousness in us. And then he says, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. So those who are ready to meet Jesus will be a holy people. So the importance of this message on obedience is absolutely necessary for us to understand and experience to be ready for Christ's coming. And as I said then, only a holy people can fellowship with a holy God that's why we must be a holy people when Jesus comes back, because he's holy. And then we can fellowship, connect with him. And that connection has to take place before that time comes. Understand what I'm saying there. We must be walking in that holiness, Holy Spirit, living out his life in us. And that's why it says when Jesus comes back in 1 John 3, we shall be like him. It'll be Jesus in us. It'll be Jesus' holiness. It'll be Jesus' righteousness. It's all Jesus, not us but we have to learn to let him do it. And so only a holy people can truly enter into fellowship with a holy God. And now when it comes down to the Sabbath, only a holy people can truly keep a holy day. It goes together as well. Next, I want us to consider what I call Sabbath spirit. There's always a danger that our religion will de degenerate into formalism. It's a problem in Christ's day. He called the Pharisees hypocrites. Their religion was legalistic, um, keeping the law to be saved. Um, it was very formal religion. Always that danger. Paul tells us that will be a characteristic in the last days. 2 Timothy 3, 5. This is describing Christians, by the way. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So as Seventh-day Adventists, there's always a danger that our religion and our Sabbath-keeping can degenerate into a form, formal obedience. Now, I think, as you've seen in this series on God's commandments, there are always deeper spiritual meanings in every commandment than just a surface reading. For example, you know, the, the Pharisees of Christ's day, uh, they knew the commandments said, um, thou shalt not commit adultery. And they think about their life, and they said, well, I've never committed the act of adultery. And Jesus came along and said, well, if you lust in your heart toward a woman, you've, com you, you've broken that commandment. So Jesus sought to take them deeper into the deeper spiritual meanings of the commandments. And that's why he said he came to magnify the law. It's such a false teaching to say that he, he came to destroy or end the law. He didn't end it. He came to magnify God's Ten Commandments. Well, what about the Sabbath? What about the Sabbath? Um, what is the spirit, the deeper meaning of the Sabbath? I looked up um, in Webster's Seventh New Collegiate Dictionary, defining spirit. Here's what defines spirit as. I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit. Idea. What's the spirit of the thing? The activating or essential principle influencing a person, an inclination, 
impulse or tendency of a specified kind, a special attitude or frame of mind, the feeling, quality, disposition characterizing something. So I would, I would ask us, what is the essential principle or spirit of the Sabbath? Well, the Sabbath is a memorial of two things. It's a memorial of God creating and God redeeming, right? Those two things, creating and redeeming. And those two works are very similar. Now, when we read, you know, there's a couple of listings of the Ten Commandments. And when we read the commandments in Deuteronomy 5, and this, this particular scripture always has meaning to me because my very first Bible study, I had just been baptized on this particular Sabbath, and some friends stopped by who I knew from high school. I, I was a senior in college at the time. And he and his wife came by, and I was all excited about my new faith. And so I started to talk to him about the Sabbath. He wasn't so much a Christian, but his wife was a Christian, and she wanted me to set up an appointment to meet with her pastor. And uh, I said, okay. And so I met with the pastor who baptized me, and we were going to study the law of God. And so the pastor that baptized me gave me a little Bible study outline on the two commandments and so forth. And um, this pastor was very kind. He let me go through my presentation. Then he went through his presentation. And you know how that goes. Then you kind of give and take after that. And um, I, I wanted to make a point on the Ten Commandments, on the Fourth Commandment. But I didn't know where the commandments were. I was that new in it. So I asked him, I said, I, I, I wanna, let's read that Fourth Commandment again. So he said, okay. So he turned his Bible and helped me find it and he turned to Exodus 20 and he said oh wait a minute wait a minute that's not it I want this one no 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 that's the one I want now there's a reason he wanted what I'm going to read to you next he wanted to go to Deuteronomy chapter 5 because here's what Deuteronomy says about the Sabbath 5 verse 12 and 15 Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord your God has commanded you. And remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Well, I, I know now why he wanted that one. Because he wanted to use that to prove the point well, the seventh-day Sabbath is given to the Jews. It's a memorial of them being, being delivered from Egypt. Being, I don't know if he's ignorant of it or not. Maybe he was. Being ignorant of the fuller, broader concept that the Sabbath is a memorial of redemption and deliverance from Egypt was a type of of the redemption that God wants to bring in all of our lives. As they were slaves in Egypt, we are slaves to sin. As God delivered them out of Egypt from that slavery, God will deliver us from sin by his power. There's a parallel there. And, he's, and God used that to tie it in with the seventh-day Sabbath. So the Sabbath is a memorial of deliverance. And Israel just experienced a mighty deliverance and so God said, look, remember to keep holy the seventh day Sabbath. I have now freed you. You are not slaves any longer. I took you out of Egypt. So now you are free to keep the seventh day Sabbath as I commanded you. I am the God who delivers you. And that's the sequence, by the way. Always. Deliverance first. Salvation first. Then obedience. Never the other way around. And we obey God because we're grateful for the deliverance he gives to us. A lot of typology there. So you see, this deliverance concept, and this is, by the way, where there's a parallel between the creation story and redemption, 
and that's why the Sabbath is a memorial of both. The earth was in darkness in creation. He brought light. We're in darkness, and God brings light to us in redemption. And we find the earth was without form and void. And God created, made perfect perfection, perfect form. And redemption, he comes and saves us. We shall be totally restored, perfect. The world was lifeless. God brought life in the, in the, in the creation and also in redemption. And in, uh, in redemption, God created Adam and Eve in his image. In creation, he did that. In redemption, he recreates us in his image. See parallels? So you've got the, the, the redemption story taught from a couple perspectives. In the creation story. Remember when Jesus says, you search the scriptures and you think in them you have eternal life, and they are way which testify of me. I tell you folks, from Genesis 1 <laughs> all the way through, it's Jesus. It's him. Now, sometimes we don't see it initially. He's there. And that's what we see in the creation story. Therefore, getting back to the point, what is the spirit of the Sabbath? The spirit or principle of the Sabbath is restoration. Restoration. <laughs> Sabbath and restoration goes hand in hand. Cooperating with God and restoring our fellow man. That's the spirit, our essence of the Sabbath. The Sabbath spirit. Cooperating with God and the restoration of our fellow man. Now, Paul talked about the ministry God's given us. You find this in um, 2 Corinthians 18. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Oh, every one of us are ministers of reconciliation. That's our calling. To be ministers of, rest, of, of restoring men and women back to God the image of God, back in their life. So, we will be keeping the spirit of the Sabbath all week if we are experiencing His restoring power in our life by resting in what He's done for us. Nigel already described that last week and at the beginning of this sermon. That's how we are experiencing what Sabbath rest symbolizes if as you go throughout the week you're resting in everything God's done for you. You've messed up, you ask God to forgive you. Trust he will, and he will. That's resting in that truth. Every night you go to bed, you can rest in the truth that God's not only forgiven you, he's given you eternal life. So if you die tonight, you'll be with him in his kingdom. You can rest in that truth. You can rest in the truth as you walk through the day. If you're tempted to some to be impatient, to be angry, you can rest in the truth that Jesus is in you, and he'll give you his patience, his whatever you need. So you rest in that. Also, <laughs> we must be cooperating with God in the restoration of our fellow man. If we are experiencing the true spirit of the Sabbath all week long. Now, how does that fit together? Well, first of all, the Baptist Holy Spirit is essential to do this. That's why you keep hearing me say it over and over. The only way you and I can cooperate with God to the restoration of a fellow man is to be spirit-filled and let it be Jesus doing it through us. That's why Jesus told the disciples, you've been with me for three and a half years. You heard all of my teaching. You've seen me do all these miracles, cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead. I sent you out and you preached them. You healed the sick. You did it all. Now you've, you've got the cross to back, look back on. I've explained that to you. 
what the death, burial, and resurrection was all about. Now you see that. And now I want you to go to the whole world, but I don't want you to go now. I want you to wait. For what? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want you to have a ministry of reconciliation, but not right now. I want you to wait until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. So that's why I say, if you and I want to truly be able to live the spirit of the Sabbath every day, to be cooperating with God in restoring our fellow men and women to God, we must be spirit-filled. Only way it happens there's an interesting text in John 7 points this out very clearly John 7 verse 38 and 39 Jesus said this he that believes on me as the scripture has said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water okay let's stop there this is taken by the way from Ezekiel remember Jesus said I'm the uh, he's, uh, Jesus says he was the temple and he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Jesus was the embodiment of the temple, and there's a whole study there. You're probably getting in that in some of your Sabbath school lessons in Daniel. Um, well, in Ezekiel, I think it's 47, you got a picture of the temple. And out of the temple flows this stream of water. And as this stream starts, it's just to the ankles, Ezekiel says. Then it's to the knees and the waist. It becomes a huge river that you can't get over. And it says, everywhere this river goes out of the temple, it brings life. Life. That's what Jesus is referring to. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, what scripture? If you don't know Ezekiel, then you don't know what he's referring to. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So if you've accepted Jesus, out from you should be flowing, symbolic language, of course, healing, restoration of your fellow men and women to God. That, that's what he wants to do through us. Because we're the temple of God, right? The Bible says Jesus lives in us, okay? Now, John clarifies it. But this spoke he of the Spirit. Ah, oh, there it is. Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Hadn't happened yet when this was written. But he's saying, he spoke about the Holy Spirit, which they that believe in him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So what he's saying here, Jesus is saying, look, once you accept me, and you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then I will perform ministries of reconciliation through you, and I will use you to bring life, spiritual life, and sometimes physical life, healing, whatever. I will use you to perform a ministry of reconciliation, a ministry of restoration, all through the week. And then when you keep the Sabbath, <laughs> that's the very spirit of the Sabbath. And it becomes even more meaningful. Now, let's, let's, let's break that a little bit down. How can I do that? And I think of myself, I'm not as young as I used to be. Some things I can't do, maybe I once did. What can I do? Does that mean I should go out and give literature? Or should we all be given Bible studies? I learned a long time ago, we all got different gifts. But I'll tell you this, if you're... You won't be a happy Christian until you're ministering in your gifts. I'll get into that someday. Gifts, that's how to be a happy Christian, too, using those gifts. But I think, okay, if, if I were to ask you, I probably shouldn't ask you. It shows you how bad of a teacher I am. If I were to ask you, what one, th what one thing, maybe I'd say two things. What two things do you hear me emphasizing all the time from the pulpit that we must do? Huh? Be spirit filled. What's the second thing? You got it. Ike, they've heard me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's it. Spirit filled and pray. Now, we've got to be spirit filled to be ministers of reconciliation. 
Prayer, wow. Prayer is probably the most powerful ministry of reconciliation there is. And I'm not exaggerating. That's why Paul said when he listed the armor of God, you know, I went through that series on the armor of God. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. There it is. Spirit filled, spirit praying through you. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. I'll tell you this. When you pray for one another, now we give you a, a prayer calendar. Why do we do that? Every day we have listed there either a member of our church or friends of our church, and we encourage you to pray for those on that day. What are you doing? You are a minister of reconciliation at that point. You are praying for them to be strengthened in their relationship with God. See, you're a minister of reconciliation. We have the prayer bowl over here. There's many names in that prayer bowl of, of loved ones and whatever that's out of the faith. You're a ministry of reconciliation when you pray for the names in there that they'll be brought to Christ. We put in your bulletin every week, I don't know if you notice it, a prayer for adult children. What are you doing when you pray that prayer? You're a minister of reconciliation. See how that works? Minister that is not complicated. <laughs> And there's other ways to be ministers of reconciliation. Sharing God's word with others. Doesn't have to be a, a long-term Bible study. I guess I'd just say this. If you pray every day, Lord, give me opportunity to witness for you. Don't tell them how to do it. Just say, Lord, give me opportunity. And then have your eyes and ears in tune for the opportunity when it arises. And it may be just one little expression or phrase or word that God will use you right there to speak to someone. That's a minister of reconciliation. Or you may give a full-blown Bible study over time. Invite someone to church. Is that a minister? Yeah. You're bringing folks to be exposed to the Word of God. Invite them to our midweek service. Same thing. Ministering to their physical needs. Yeah. Did Jesus care about physical needs? Of course he did. He healed a lot, right? <laughs> in fact, if you look at his healing, he did more healing than about anything else. He's concerned about our physical needs. And in fact, in Matthew 25, he got the sheep and the goats and so forth, and, and he lists, he said, you know, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was in prison, naked, whatever, and, and you did this to me, and I, oh, when, did, when did we do that to you? You did it one of the least these are my brother, you did it to me. So when you're involved in helping people physically, food, clothing, whatever it is, you are a minister of reconciliation. You are helping them be restored back to where God wants them to be. As it says, characteristic of those ready to meet Jesus. And so why did Jesus heal so much on the Sabbath? What did I say? He came to magnify the law. And what's the Sabbath? What's the spirit of the Sabbath? Restoration. Then why did he heal a lot on the Sabbath? He was magnifying the spirit, the deeper meaning of the Sabbath. It's restoration. Then one day he healed a lady, Luke 13, on the Sabbath, and the ruler of the synagogue criticized him. That always surprised me. <laughs> Someone get healed on the Sabbath, you want to criticize him? Well, that's where they were. You know what Jesus called him? Hypocrite. Now, why would he use that word? Because that man was totally ignorant of what the Sabbath meant. He was a legalistic, formal, strict Sabbath keeper. I mean, he watched every minute. And be sure he didn't break it at the beginning, and be sure he didn't break it at the end. He was strict. Pretty proud in that too, I think. And he criticized Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, you hypocrite. You have no idea what the Sabbath is all about. Nothing. 
No, that's what the Sabbath's about. And you know, when you, when, one of the chapters, this many years ago, I read Isaiah 58 and I started studying that. Isaiah chapter 58 is an amazing chapter in the Old Testament. It describes, it's kind of like the Laodicea message in, in, uh, in the Old Testament. Isaiah 58 begins by saying, you know, you say you do all these things and you're really uh, living up to the faith like you're supposed to. And then, Lord, why don't you hear us, and, you know? And, and then God says, hey, <laughs> this is the fast that I ask you to do. And then he, he lists it, Isaiah 58, verse 6, he says, Loose the bands of wickedness. Now think of restoration here. Loose the bands of wickedness. Undo the heavy burdens. Let the oppressed go free. Break every yoke. Deal your bread to the hungry. Bring the poor that are cast out your house. When you see the naked, you cover him. Hide not yourself from your own flesh. A whole list of things that they should have been doing to cooperate with God in restoring others to relationship with himself and helping their fellow man. That's Isaiah 58. And he says, if you do this, you are going to be greatly blessed. Your, you know, your light shall burst out. And he calls them, you will be, you will be, you that do this, will be the repairs of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Now, what's the breach? The breach is in the law. And then, he t and then he speaks about the Sabbath. If you turn your foot from the Sabbath, from, you know, and he talks to him about keeping the Sabbath. So what's he saying there? He's tying the Sabbath in with this ministry of reconciliation. And he says, and, and we, we pride ourselves a bit <laughs> as Seventh-day Adventists that we uphold the Sabbath. We know what the mark of the beast is. We know what's going to happen at the end time. But this text says those that who will really restore the Sabbath are those that are cooperating with God in reconciling their fellow man to God. That's what this Isaiah 58 is saying. They're the ones cooperating with God in ministry of reconciliation. They're the ones that shall repair the breach. Now, Ellen White, I, amazing quote, came across many years ago. She quotes Isaiah 58, verse 12. And she puts together Sabbath, Isaiah 58, Ministers of Reconciliation. She says this, All who love God will show that they bear His sign by keeping His commandments. They are the restorers of paths to dwell in. The Lord says, If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure my only day, called the Sabbath delight, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth. Then she says this. Thus, genuine medical missionary work is bound up inseparably with the keeping of God's commandments, of which the Sabbath is especially mentioned, since it is the great memorial of God's creative work. Its observance is bound up with the ministry of restoring the ministry of restoring the moral image of God and man. See, that's the spirit of the Sabbath. This is the ministry which God's people are to carry forward at this time. This ministry, rightly performed, will bring rich blessings to the church. Bottom line, if I don't understand what it really means to rest in the Lord 100%, for every aspect of my salvation. Now, I'm not saying I'm lost, but I'm saying I'm not really keeping the Sabbath as God wants me to. I may be meticulous looking when the sun goes exactly down when it begins on Friday and when it goes exactly down when it ends on Saturday. I may be very meticulous on that and some other things here. And all that's not bad, perhaps. But if I'm not...
truly resting in Christ 100% for my salvation, I'm missing the heart of it. The heart of it. And if I'm not truly seeking to be used by God to cooperate with him in restoring my fellow man and woman to the image of God and helping them physically, spiritually, every way as God leads. If I'm not doing that through the week, again, I'm missing the very point of the Sabbath. And there's a danger for us as Adventists if we're missing those key points we have to be careful our Sabbath keeping may truly be a form a formality I do want to add this again God knows our heart and and, and I'm sure none of us are where God wants us to be (laughs) we're still growing in this but I do challenge us today to look seriously at some of the deeper meanings of, of, of what true Sabbath keeping is and how it's a matter of an activity all week long so that when the Sabbath does come, it has, I tell you, it has a a depth and a height and breadth of meaning. Wow, what a day of celebration when you think about it. So God is preparing a holy people. As I said, kind of in the announcement, we see things going on in the world today. He's coming He's preparing a holy people because it's only a holy people that can have that close relationship with him, the holy God. And it's our privilege and it's our honor to be that holy people, to cooperate with God in restoring our fellow man to the image of God, It's our privilege and honor to proclaim the true Sabbath to the world, to proclaim its depth of meaning. It's significant in these last days, and we know it will be. That's our privilege to do that. And according to Isaiah 58, it's those who understand and are cooperating with God in this ministry of reconciliation that will truly restore the Sabbath to its right place. And they, I think we can see how that, will, how that will fit in. You know, if, if people talked about the Clearview Church and they said, oh yeah, that's those people that go to church on Saturday and they, they say most of them don't eat meat, That's okay, I guess. But if they could say, you know, when I'm around that person, they seem like they just want to talk about Jesus all the time. They seem to really love Jesus. Or they say, you know, they they really are caring. You know, there was a neighbor over there I heard about, and they had a certain need, and they really went to work to help that person. Now, I'm not scolding us. We got a wonderful congregation, and as pastor, I hear all kinds of good stuff. We have people here that care. And if there's someone hurting, we have members that go over there. So I praise God for that. And it's those kind of things that people take notice of in a community. I remember reading in history, I like history, back in the early centuries, and they put prison, uh, Christians in prison. And back in those days, you weren't fed by the prison. <laughs> Christians would die, deny themselves food so their brothers and sisters in prison could have food. And there was a pagan writer that said, Behold how they love one another. If that was the testimony that we had, I don't think the Seventh day Sabbath would be much of an issue to people. They'd say, Hey, I don't care what day you go to church on, I want to go there. I want to experience what you got. And that's where God wants to take us. And I think he is. We're in process. I'm in process. But that's where he wants to take us. So I've chosen for our closing song today is number 500, Take Time to Be Holy. And I also want to mention that if there's anyone that's never given your life to Christ and you you feel you'd like to, come up front, your left, after the service, or if you feel you've wandered away, 
and you'd like to come back for prayer, both these are for prayer, come up front to the left after the service. Shall we stand? I thank you, Father, that you are such a loving, understanding Heavenly Father. And I thank you, too, that truly you who know us best love us most. Father, your word calls us to holiness, but we realize that's an impossible an impossible goal to achieve on our own. We just can't do it. However, every command you give us, you promise to fulfill it in our life. So, Father, we ask you to do the same here. Whatever needs to be changed, whatever we need to do to cooperate with you to become that holy people, we give you permission to move in our lives to bring that about. Fill us again right now with your spirit. Jesus is the holy one, and we know it's only as Jesus is seen in us and lives out his righteous holiness in us that we'll be holy. So, Father, we give you permission. Make us that holy people. So that when that day comes, 
when that judgment is over, just before Jesus returns to this earth, and the statement is made, let him that is holy remain holy, and he that is righteous remain righteous, may that describe us. Because we have our holiness and our righteousness 100% in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Dennis Smith, pastor of the Clearview Seventh Avenue Church. We're located at 19554 North Papaco Drive in Surprise, Arizona. The major focus in our church is, of course, on Jesus Christ and also on prayer and the Holy Spirit. I find it interesting that when Christ gave us what's called the Lord's Prayer, as part of that prayer, we were to ask the Father that His will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And that's fascinated me for years. And it had a major impact in my life and as a pastor to realize that when God wants something done in this world, it's absolutely essential that we as Christians ask Him to do it. And that gives Him the rite of passage. So in our church here in Surprise, we have as our mission statement to be spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, and spirit-led. I'd like to invite you to visit us when you're in our area. Our Sabbath school service begins at 9.20 on Saturday morning, and our worship service begins at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. Hope to see you then.